party to our webinar here. We're happy to be joined with our partners in loss prevention from Sorensen and Wilder and Associates. Today I'm joined by Glenn Nixon and Steve Wilder, who are very kind enough to help us out on very short notice with our presentation on civil disturbance responding to a crisis. I'm Nini Durada. I work with Gallagher Bassett. I am a law control consultant, actually um, in the law control division, work with a lot of our partners in prevention of uh, sensation, auto, and other claims. I'm in early on as he's uh, happy enough to do some of the introductions. And first, I'd like to hear from uh, Steve Wilder and uh, see if you can uh, quick introduction to our presentation and we can move on from there. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. And hello, everybody. Thanks for allowing us to be a part of your day and a, a part of uh, your ongoing discussions and concerns during these tenure times that we're dealing with. Uh, when we first talked with Vernon and, and uh, his group yesterday, uh, they're in the same boat that many of you are and that we are as an organization, as a small business. Uh, we're dealing with some very challenging times right now and preparedness is critical. And our goal on this is uh, we'd like to be able to give you the recipe to prevent anything from ever happening, but that recipe does not exist. Uh, we'll try to give you some ideas today on ways that you can uh, put yourself in a position of safety, minimize your exposure, uh, and, and lessen the chances of finding yourselves a victim of some of the uh, uh, behaviors that we're seeing in our society right now. A little bit on my background, uh, I've been uh, in healthcare management for 35 years now, which is pretty amazing because I'm only 39 years old. Uh, he uh, uh, started my career in the early 1980s uh, uh, as the director of risk management at the hospital in the south suburbs of Chicago. I uh, 15 years at the hospital uh, and then had the opportunity as hospitals became part of uh, bigger healthcare systems. I had the opportunity to go to the corporate office and in the role of corporate director of risk management over the long term care division. I uh, held this position for four years and uh, then had an opportunity to assume a position of the uh, Director of Safety and Security over our hospitals and 15 long-term care facilities. In 2001, my business partner, Chris Sunson, and I founded Sorensen Wilder and Associates. Uh, we've been, as I tell everybody, we've been very blessed. People say you've been lucky. I say, no, we've been blessed. Uh, our company has worked hard, but we've grown. Uh, today, we serve uh, over 500 clients in 49 states. Uh, so, you know, we, we're very thankful for everything we've got. Uh, do a lot of work for the insurance industry, as you can obviously tell sitting here working with Vernon and the great folks at uh, Gallagher Bassett. Uh, do a lot of work for defense law firms and insurance companies on a national level. Uh, hold multiple certifications from uh, uh, different uh, entities, including the United States Department of Homeland Security. And I'm very proud that I also had the honor and privilege to serve 35 years in the fire service, uh, the last eight as the uh, chief of the fire department. Uh, uh, here in the south suburbs of Chicago. So I've uh, been very blessed, very fortunate, uh, been in the right place at the right time. And if I'm thankful for anything, it's the great staff that I'm surrounded by in my office on a daily basis uh, and the great people that we work with, such as the folks from Gallagher Bassett, such as uh, the folks at Five Safety, who I know so many of you know so well. Uh, that being said, I'd like to introduce uh, a very key member of our staff. Uh, Vernon's already mentioned him, uh, Glenn Nixon. Just, and I'm not going to steal any of Glenn's thunder, but Glenn joined us a couple of years ago after an amazing career in law enforcement and has uh, quickly moved up and has developed a great reputation with our clients, a uh, great provider of services to our clients. So uh, it's a real honor to be able to introduce Glenn Nixon. Glenn. Well, Glenn is muted out here, so let me unmute Glenn. Sorry. Glenn, you might want to start over. I think you're <laughs> muted there. I got you unmuted. Okay. Sorry, thank you. Thanks, Vernon, for having us, and uh, Steve for for giving us the ability to uh, to meet with all of your clients like this. Uh, I retired recently uh, after 23 years in law enforcement. Uh, if Steve is as young as he claims, I can still claim to be 38 too. Um, <laughs> I've been uh, everything from the ranks of the patrol officer when I first got out, all the way through. Uh, uh, management and policy development when I finally retired. 
uh, one of the biggest issues is we had a, a huge community event, uh, an NFL team that hosted their training camp in our community, and I ran that uh, uh, detail, security detail for about 18 years that they were there. Uh, I'm telling you, numbers of people that came into the town, an influx of people that we weren't ready for, we weren't used to, and, and a lot from that. We learned a lot from that experience. I was a school resource officer, and I'm uh, an avid firearms uh, a consultant, and uh, still teach today. So, when that experience together, it gives uh, a different view—the tactical view, and again, the security logistics view of of what we're doing. So, this kind of dovetails right in with what we're discussing today. So, in that, when I started with Sorensen Wilder a couple of years ago. Uh, we applied uh, the things we learned as police officers with aggression management, so aggression management and uh, 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 the instructor. And talk about uh, security vulnerability assessments, special hazard vulnerability assessments, things like that we do. And we also go out for policy development. So I do a lot of policy development for some of our clients and train on those. We do drills, active shooter drills, things like that, disaster drills, exercises, and uh, incident command structure. So I'm excited to do this. I'm excited to, to offer this education today. Vernon, thank you very much for it. And if we're ready, here we go. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to work with you. I'll bring our audience up to speed a little bit of the behind the scenes over the weekend, as many of you. I was watching uh, events unfold with protests and uh, escalating violence uh, throughout our nation. and. Me, I thought of a lot of you, uh, our business partners out there, and uh, potentially at risk. And I went through our partnership, and our friends at Sorensen and Wilder answered the call, came through. We were talking in the development of this, and I'm, I'm very happy uh, for everybody's sake that we were able to put this in presentation together so quick. I think uh, we were able to stand on all the work that's been done by our partners, and really appreciate that. Um, so everybody understands the development of something like this. We're talking ahead of time, and of course, as a certified safety professional, uh, when people come to me, if it's not an area of my purview, one of the first things that I'm trained to do is to bring them to a better expert, uh, to give information that I'm not an expert in. So my first step was to educate myself a little bit, and I look uh, like some of you do, but very similar to my process in other areas looking at civil unrest, uh, learning a little bit more about the term civil disturbance and how it's used. In particular, I have this uh, document I found on civil unrest, which was put out by uh, FEMA, and it was a joint uh, partnership between the Fire Administration and Police Administration. And it amazes me, and I read it, and it sounds like today's headlines. And I'll read this little segment that's on the screen box there in yellow. It says, in general, riots are formed in several distinct stages. The first stage occurs when a group of people is moved to commit acts of civil disorder. In the second stage, other individuals with no interest in the issue join the action to take advantage of an opportunity to loot and destroy property. The third stage occurs when organized youth gangs join the disturbance and take it to their communities. Action range from looting to ambush and sniper attacks directed against police and fire personnel. I had and I said, wow, that sounds like it's ripped from today's headlines. But actually, this was a document that was produced in 1994, way back when uh, even these young whippersnapper presenters did lead today. Uh, even when Steve and Glenn were young enough to be out there. Uh, being persons of interest, possibly. But joking aside, obviously, this is a very serious topic. I say again to Glenn and Steve for seeing up and presenting. And with all my um, talking over, I'm going to turn it right back over to Glenn to really give us some good information as we move forward. Thank you. So one of the issues that uh, we need to talk about is this, this hasn't been something that just came up suddenly. This has been a long time in coming. Long before Ferson, long before all of the issues out in the have been around for a long time. What the weapon now is they've gotten really good at them. 
as just professional organizers have turned these riots, these gatherings, these protests into fear, and they've brought it to a whole new level of expertise. And they know exactly what to do and how to do it and how to manipulate people so they create more destruction and get more message. So we've seen these isolated riots recently in Minneapolis spread throughout the United States all about the globe. Uh, the riots equivalent to the, what we're seeing in, in Minneapolis, all the way out in, in uh, uh, Argentina, in Chile, and, and every corner of the world. So we can be sensitive that this isn't just an isolated thing. This is something we're going to deal with for a long term. The intelligence committee said a long, a long time ago, uh, in March 7 of 2017, in a U.S. Senate committee hearing on intelligence, that, that the future it includes soft targets in crowded places. Soft targets in crowded places are intentionally designed for public use, That's something you can't close off. It could be a festival, it could be a park area, it can be shopping malls, it can be uh, just local facilities that have to be there, that have to be open, and the public generally uses these. So if you can control those facilities, whether it be schools or uh, shopping malls, government buildings, things like that, streets, if you can control that, you're going to demand attention, and that's what they're doing. So this isn't something that is is uh, just haphazard. These are professionals that are planning this. I expect this to end tomorrow or next week or next month. We continue on. Uh, insert reason here. So the perps are going to continue to work, work through these plans just as we try and work through mitigation measures. Talk about today is we're going to talk about the concepts of crowd violence, uh, understand the need for your preparedness, uh, recognize your distinct vulnerabilities, and we'll talk about the available technology. And then we're going to talk about necessary response to these events, some suggestions. Everything is customized to your facility, your location, but with some some guidelines, some things to come come up with yourself. And and then help create, and then offer, offer as a professional to help you further design how to target harden, and then how to design future uh, so it's not so susceptible. Use yourself from the from the potential of, of criminal behavior. And then we're going to talk about developing policy and plans to supplement your existing murders. So anytime you've got emergency operation plans, anything you come up with in direct response to civil disobedience, uh, we, and we want to sure that's done in and it, it works seamlessly with your existing plans. If you don't have existing plans, you need to talk to us so you can get some existing plans in place because that puts you at a distinct liability when something happens. So let's talk about uh, uh, emergency operation plans a little bit. We'll talk about how to target harden your facility, utilizing whatever you have in a hurry, but then thinking long term and utilizing things like SEPTED. Uh, criminal deterrence. So, how to design your building so it's naturally you know, less likely to be criminalized, and how it's very important to train your staff to respond. And then, done with confidence means that they are trained. You're, you're to have that component in place, that training component. And if you build a new policy or plan, and make trained to it. So, these pros have become uh, protesters. You know, professionals that get paid by underground groups, and they've been around for a long time. Now, see, the other this is we mean this as a result, and what you're seeing on on your screen right now is is advertisements for activist jobs that are planned for those specific areas for an event to create civil unrest, to uh, make the groups larger, to give some direction and guidance. They pay some staff to to guide other people to manipulate other people emotionally or during the heat of the moment. That mob mentality is easy to create if you just have one person directing the, the uh, activity. So hey, protesters are a real thing and it's put There's lawsuits that have been filed after the Ferguson protests when people were paid what they were supposed to be paid. So this is a real thing. We've seen uh, pallet bricks and stone in Chicago, in New York, and in St. Louis, and other towns, Mr. in public roadways.
who's delivering, who's paying for these pallets of bricks? Well, there's an organization that's paying for that, and they encourage people to move towards those directions. And acts and and, and uh, retail establishments. So these are highly organized events. This isn't just a group of people and a thunder group comes off and creates damage. These are very talented individuals who know how to put people in a place and incite this violence. So this is what you're preparing for. It's not just the random acts of violence that you're hearing about on TV. So again, violence, the dynamics are, uh, are very uh, specific. You'll see certain things happening, right? This is phase two of that 1990 uh, article. Crowds can quickly escalate because they're pushed, right? They're manipulated. Anyone and anything can incite random violence, and they're good at this. The, the, the managers of the event are, are kind of clean, the other people that are local to do violence. Some protests and groups are not intending to be violent, but then they interject the other you know, abilities to incite that, to build that frustration, to build that energy. And it takes us a little tiny spark to create that big flame. I'll capitalize on this so they can get attention and be legitimized almost by the deal. There are national protest managers that lead this energy and lead this crowd to a violent mentality when it's advantageous for them. And then we got to think about these paid protesters, these local groups groups of paid people just to go there and take part in these events. And this violence just builds and builds and it, it becomes a storm almost. So be aware this isn't uh, this isn't just your local people. So crowds can quickly escalate. Once you start seeing this crowd violence move forward, it, it can it can rapidly build and that we want to be ready for. The next thing one of the crowds start looking at what the crowds do. Now, whether they're just walking or haters are kind of participating, but they're they're watching, they could be expressive. They start threatening, they are saying things, they start engaging each other or engaging counter protest groups. And we do that quite a bit too. Then them hostile and aggressive. It could be towards the police, it could be towards the buildings, it could be towards other people protecting their buildings. We've seen that in St. Louis when a retired police officer was uh, killed during, during these riots when he was paid to defend a uh, retail establishment. So stories. And we're hearing more and more and more of those, but that takes some of the headline too. So they know that there's risk associated with that. Once they become aggressive and hostile, look for the demonstrative acts, uh, picking up bricks, picking up things. Uh, New York City has now removed all the trash cans in the public areas because they were using trash cans to throw through windows. So start watching for incidents to start to happen. And then you'll see the innocent people, the, the true protesters that are nonviolent, they'll start to scatter. That's called escapement. And then you'll see people getting hurt because they're getting trampled. They're compacting. You know, the large groups of people will then compact in a, in a hurry and people get hurt that way. And the terrorizing then begins. That's when they start... Uh, Becoming violent and damaging towards building structures, homes, cars, whatever's in the in the pathway to, to create damage. The rushing that somebody breaks into a building, a retail establishment, that rushing starts, and the looting and the attacking starts, and then engage police or any authorities or anyone else by throwing rocks and stones and bottles. And if these are the uh, bricks that are placed in the middle of the road, that's going to happen. The, the breaking glass, the damaging property, that's all part of the routine. Steve? Yeah, just a minute ago, you were talking about the paid protester groups, and it brought to mind as recently as last night, I was on an interview on media with uh, a young man who said he worked for one of these protest groups. He named it, I'm not going to say the name, uh, a very familiar name. Uh, but he said uh, it's exciting because he gets a check uh, for a protest he does, and he thinks it's great because it's signed by this well-known name. And he said that it's a pyramid scheme, that he gets $500 for every one of these events that he attends because he's been doing it for so long now. But then he gets an additional $500 for every person he signs up to and join in and participate. So I'm getting an hourly rate, uh, as you mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, recruiters are getting a, a almost a, 
a counter fee to bring more people in. So I thought it was very interesting when he said it, it becomes a pyramid scheme, that that was exactly what it sounded like. Right, right, it's, and it has become a, a profession almost. Now keep in mind, it's not illegal to have a protest, to gather, right? That's, that's our constitutional right. But legal and illegal acts start occurring. So that's where this, this fine line comes into play. The need for this falls into play to be prepared and have a plan. So first thing is your facility has to have a plan. You've got an idea of what your what your goal is. What do you want to accomplish and how do you want to defend against potential attacks or the event itself? So this situation is not generally required by, by code, so we don't see uh, anyone enforcing if you don't have a civil, civil disobedience plan. But you're going to need to have this that that complementary with your existing plans for uh, evacuation, lockdown, things like that. They should work with each other. Civil unrest plans are are generally customized to your facility based on your risk and your hazard vulnerability, your exposure to the potential for issues like this. And in some places, it's going to happen a lot. Unfortunately, you're in a high uh, probability area for these types of incidences or just close by on main roadways where these incidences do happen. So you've got to have kind of a, a hazards uh, vulnerability assessment as a preliminary feature of, of the plan. So know where your hazards are at so you can then plan to that and, and build that. So your membership, because you're not there all the time as an owner, your leadership needs to understand the plan. You to expose them to it and train them to it and have have them have a leadership understanding of how to apply this, when to apply it, and what the roles are going to be, and then how to disseminate the information to the to the other people that are going to help assist throughout this response. There are specific dangers that you experience during these events that you don't generally see in other situations. So we have to kind of blend in different emergency operations plans based on this, on this, uh, on this isolated incident. Incident. Facilities protect vulnerable people, then them to keep them safe. So we have to have uh, additional exclusionary factors to make sure that you've got things in place to realize that you have a duty to protect people inside your facility. So that could be the long-term care facilities, the medical facilities, things like that. So you're going to have to take additional measures to make sure you're doing the right things. So we can help you with that if you have no idea how to apply this, but it's important that you do have some plan and some training. The next thing we want to look at is, is really your vulnerabilities. So the, there is a you know big front retail store. That's that's a huge vulnerability, and that's what these protesters are specifically targeting. Easy places to to get a lot of people into. Now we do see some good things with this. We we see some uh, and ramming bollards to keep trucks or vehicles from crashing into the building and literally just open them up floodgates of people to, to drive a vehicle right into the front of the building. So that's to protect the uh, in itself, but also to protect from that massive in, uh, incursion. So we think about things like that at the design stage and then realize that if you don't have that in play already, you need to think about how to revitalize and and look at specific vulnerabilities with your facility. You may not be able to fix everything in a vulnerability or hazards assessment, but start taking some steps towards redesign or realize that we need to make some tentative fixes so there are, uh, there are applicable things that we can do. Don't rely on local police or local fire to give you this advice and give you the technical knowledge that you're gonna need to realize hazards. You know, coming 23 years in law enforcement, and I did a lot of these hazards, vulnerability assessments for local businesses as a police officer. I looked at it from a police officer standpoint. I went in with Sorensen Wilder and started thinking a little bit differently about uh, how we look at vulnerabilities. There's a lot more lawyers involved in, in this, and this has been a passion for my life for a long, long time. So. Even local police may not have the uh, specific knowledge to, to guide you through that. There are professionals that can provide these uh, informational 
uh, uh, hazard, special hazard vulnerability assessments, and and uh, uh, assessments. I just wanted to make mention that uh, you know Gap that works with our partners like Sorensen and Wilder to provide security consulting expertise, specifically offering security vulnerability assessments and also training for workplace violence and armed intruder response. So as you're listening to all of these um, best practices and these other keys that Glenn is sharing. I do want you to know that um, our relationship includes pleading these secure vulnerability assessments, and that's something that we should all think about very seriously. I know it's, uh, a lot of us are on uh, look for a quick fix for this immediacy, but as looking through and thinking about planning for the future, I think this is a fantastic opportunity for us to be analyzing all of these fantastic uh, suggestions and keys. And again, thank you, Glenn, uh, for sharing all of this with us. So more of a statement than a question, but thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So now, once we start realizing our vulnerabilities and we have to understand what our capabilities are now as far as technology, to rely completely on technology is never a good idea. And if one tries to sell you something that's going to solve all the problems, take stack. You know, get some get some some personals in to help you with this too. Never rely on technology alone to keep you safe. It's not going to work. You know, there are great products out there, but no one for all exists. All technology has benefits and faults. So, hardware can't be perfect. It never works perfectly. The mitigation factors that, that we look for in our hardware. Uh, any technology that you can deploy immediately, if you realize you. You've got uh, extreme exposure because of last fronts, things like that. Let's look at 3M security film, an inexpensive fix that's applied to the window and time. So, an incursion, somebody starts throwing bricks, the wheel shadows, shatters just like temper not should, but it doesn't matter and completely fall inside. That, that film that's applied to the inside of the glass has a strength and integrity that uh, keeps them from entering the facility for two or three minutes. And if you go to 3M's website, they've got all kinds of demonstrations on, on security films that are inside windows. And it takes a long time to get through this glass. That deterrent may be just enough time so you can get your employees out of a, a safer exit. That deterrent may be just enough time to keep somebody from, from breaking and they'll move on somewhere else and, and pick a, a more vulnerable facility. Uh, flashing lights and the emergency sirens, those are all great. That's keep people from breaking if they're not the professional burglars. Uh, it helps keep honest people honest. You want to get caught. And in these insurgences, there's only so many police officers and so many people and so many locations being set on fire, burned, rotted, looted, whatever else. So those are typical hardware things are not going to uh, create a deterrent enough sufficient to keep someone from getting in. Modern investments now take a step up and looking at roll down uh, glass protection, so those roll down shades, and those can be even defeated too. But it adds again a longer time of deterrence. So you team up the 3M safety film with the roll down shades or the security gates. It's sad to see that we're going in time to those security gates, and that, that gives a whole different feeling to your facility and establishment. But what's happening, and I don't see this ending anytime soon, so. We do need more and more companies investing in, in uh, heavier security now at, at their uh, retail establishments. You've got to a response. Based on what you have available, you need to respond that uh, work for your facility, your specific location, and we can help map that out a little bit of what it would look like for your specific facility. But everything has uh, customization involved in situations like this. So what you do in the end, is commit to a policy and put it into your operations plan and then provide some guidelines and support the people that are responsible for your facility when leadership is not there because that's probably what's going to happen, right? And, you know, that's Murphy's Law. So make sure people that are large when you're not there understand what the policy is and how to deploy the policy. 
uh, don't keep it in the binder and nobody ever finds it out. And that's what we find so often is that these policies and plans go in the binder and we've gone, but nobody ever gets to it. You need to build on the responses that you already have in your emergency operations plan and make make this complementary to your lockdown and evacuation system. So always, always include the incident command system so we can disseminate responsibility information and one person in charge. If you're not familiar with the incident command system, go on to the Homeland Security website and take the class. You can do it all online. It gives you a great understanding of how to efficiently deploy people in specific roles so they can then complete the time and come back to one person. It best subtracts the uh, confusion out of a confusing crisis. Uh, uh, target hardening. Target hardening is how to uh, strengthen the integrity of your facility so they'll go to somewhere else. It could be a prompt to response like barricades, like the flag you see in, in the picture behind you. Uh, it could just deter infiltration from a distance. So if your site is off of the main uh, area of, of uh, image, then you've got something you, you can put between the potential uh, and your location. So it could be uh, a semi truck, it could be trailers, it could be like we've seen in some of these home home improvement stores where they stack up uh, sheets of drywall and pallets of cement and and things that uh, uh, that they approach can't pick up, they can't move, they can't use to into your facility. Strapping things down with additional uh, steel straps, things like that. So. Think of what you can do with your existing products to strengthen the integrity of your facility. And start looking at how do we secure our entrances, our glass entranceways. It could be steel sheeting, it could be the gates, it could be roll down shutters, especially 3M window coatings. Uh, start planning this for expansions and then look at the outside of your building and plan what can we do to make it a little bit harder for people to criminalize. It could be land improvements, it, it could be uh, landscaping improvements, and by ramming bollards that are placed into the into the facility, uh, facade so they're complementary to your building. Start using what we call SEPTED in your building designs and and in deploy those uh, to reduce the potential for criminalization in your facility. A train is of importance. So you need to make sure that you're training your facility, provide employee training and education so they know what to do, they know what to expect, so this isn't uh, something new to them at the time when something happens, and assure that they understand this policy, assure that they know how to operate, and we design positions based on who's there and who's not there. And then it's important to drill. And what about this? So many times in our in our classes that we teach at uh, facilities, you have to put policy in place, train to it, and then confirm understanding and confirm that policy conforms with your operational abilities. Drill. You've got to get a, a tabletop scenario of, of a situation and then put it into play. And then expand or contract the policy as necessary of, based on your capabilities. Training builds confidence. So the more you train to it, the more confident your employees will be. Turn this over for some questions. Great. Uh, thanks again for the fantastic uh, presentation. Really appreciate all the information. I know everybody else here does as well. I've got some questions. I know Steve might have a comment as well. But in the meantime, I want to ask our first question um, on private security. Um, if uh, you want to advance here, let's see. I can expand. Do you want a slide, Glenn? Oh. Okay. Private security. <laughs> Our first question is on private security. Uh, the question is, what is a good process to consider when deciding if private security is needed, and what things should one look for when selecting additional security? You would like to start off? A yeah. uh, couple thoughts that come to mind. Uh, first of all, if you're waiting until the windows are being broken out to be thinking about private security, you've waited too late. Uh, that's not a good time to go shopping. Uh, you need to identify the potential resources that you're going to need, and it's the same as we talk about in recovery planning. Uh, you need to identify the likely resources you're going to need if something like this happens well in advance, 
and build a relationship with uh, uh, the companies that can provide those resources. So in this case, we're talking about private security. Uh, now time, or, or maybe uh, uh, when all this is over and we're back in normal business, uh, is the time to go out and start looking for a private security agency to be a resource to you if you're going to need them in a hurry. And you need to uh, identify if you're going to need armed or unarmed security. Uh, and if they're going to be capable of providing that. Uh, and I'll tie that in with the next part of the question, Glenn, is uh, uh, what things should one look for when selecting additional security? Well, look at the training of the type of people they're giving you. There are some really outstanding companies, and we don't endorse companies per se, but there are some really outstanding companies out there to work with. Um, but there's also a lot of what we call trunk slammers who have uh, a couple shifts here and there in security and think now they're qualified to be uh, a contract security person. And some states don't require any type of licensing or anything else. So do your homework. Find out uh, what their training qualifications. You really don't want somebody coming in and check your uh, business, your people, your employees, whatever the case may be, your clients, uh, who last night was working security at a movie theater uh, and the night before that was selling burgers at a fast food place. That's not give you any degree of protection. You need a qualified professional. So do homework, do it before you need them uh, so you can build that relationship. Great, and obviously, you know, as the insurance person here, I'd say make sure you have great contracts, you uh, sign contracts with any of your vendors, especially private to key and make sure uh, that they're reputable. And going along with that, it means that they you have great contracts and they have great uh, questions on the insurance side as well so that you have a great partner. It's a great, great partner, partner, not just somebody you're, you're hiring uh, to do one little task. You really should look at them as a partner because if, God forbid, there is some kind of a shooting or something, you're right there at their hip pocket, uh, arm in arm with uh, um, the aftermath. So maybe you're working with somebody that you're proud to work with. That's my advice. And um, we can on. So the next question is near and dear to my heart. Uh, as I do plenty of traveling for work. And the question is, what, what safety recommendations are there for people required to travel? What items, if any, should they have with them? Uh, before I turn that over to you, I will say I know for uh, Gallagher, it, uh, we have things like SOS International, where there are services out there that uh, employers can have to notify their employees of all kinds of calamities where they would be known on their cell phone about uh, impending issues uh, wherever they might be. This is an international service. I'm not condoning it, but I just want to let you know that it's something that we use uh, to keep ourselves informed, uh, especially people who are traveling uh, into international areas, uh, high-risk areas. It's something that's available. And there are other services like that out there. So. Um, I have some of my own strategies, of course, for for traveling for work, but uh, let, this is uh, definitely a security time for us to talk about. So, Glenn and, and Steve, uh, I don't know which one of you want to take this one, maybe Glenn? Sure. You know, the, the biggest thing is uh, have an established plan. And if someone, either your employer or a family member, knows exactly what the plan is, uh, where you're going, how you're getting there, uh, make sure equipped if it's a driving assignment and you're going across states or uh, driving a, a, a pathway from point A to point B, make sure that someone knows and check in occasionally. Make sure that uh, someone knows where you're at and, and that uh, you're prepared for the trip. Uh, in situations like uh, civil unrest, when you're traveling anywhere from town to town, make sure you're aware of what roads are open, what roads are closed. That changes from day to day, sometimes hour to hour. And if you're new to a uh, location and you're traveling in and that road is suddenly shut down, uh, unless you've got good GPS, it may not uh, it may not be an alternative route. So make sure you're not driving into a problem or you know coming too close to one. The next thing is make sure your your vehicle is is uh, up to date, maintained. Uh, you won't break down where, and don't run yourself low on gas. Uh, things like that can can uh, cause problems and push a situation that you don't want to be in. Uh, otherwise, make sure you always have a car charger on you and some protection in the wintertime, so blankets, 
something warm in case you uh, do get somewhere. And now as you run into the start time, make sure you get some water in the in the vehicle, and, uh, uh, some food stocks. Uh, always be in touch with uh, with someone on one end or the other of your trip. And make sure you're prepared all the way through uh, where you're going, where you're coming from, and, uh, and make sure you check in quite often. There's GPS tracking agents now that you can put in your car. Someone back at the office or at your home knows exactly where you're at, things like that. Steve? Steve? You put so many nails on the head there, Glenn. The other one that I'm going to throw in is, uh, and, and again, this goes back to, you know, I haven't been teaching this, it's the pre-GPS days, if you will. Uh, one of the things we've always advocated is that if you're going to be working on the road and you're going to be traveling, especially by vehicle, put your map, plan your route in advance. Communicate that route with your family and with your office so that if uh, something happens along the way and you don't reach your intended destination or they don't hear from you or for some reason somebody has to go looking for you, uh, know the route that you are going to be taking. It's a great starting point and it can save a lot of valuable time if they know the route you're going to be taking. Now, that being said, that falls back on uh, the worker, uh, the person who's doing traveling. You have to stick to that route. You know, this, uh, you know, driving home and, oh, shoot, i got to stop and get milk. Uh, that's fine, but then let somebody know they're doing that. Uh, and everybody's got cell phones these days. Call a family member, call the office, call somebody, and let them know you're stopping to get that milk or whatever it might be a stop for, uh, just so they know that you're deviating from the planned route. So, again, if something should happen in the parking lot or the grocery store, whatever the case may be, people know where you're at. Nobody's wondering where you were. Uh, and where you went when you left your intended route. So the next we have is related to construction crews. What recommendations do you, either of you have for our friends who are in the construction industry? You know, this always comes up too. If it's roadway construction, again, uh, maker, your facility manager, your operations manager knows exactly where the risk is. If there are any risks close to your location, shut the project down, move your equipment and protect, and you know, subtract yourself from the equation. Uh, we always say that there's there's three components to the time equation: the criminal, the opportunity, and the victim. If you can remove one of those, it uh, it does wonders. So the other part of it is remember your construction equipment. If you're working in a building and your equipment's out of your truck, uh, listen, the truck and the equipment. Is you want to take ownership of that and protect it. Uh, only do what you can do. Don't put your life at risk for anything that can be replaced by an insurance policy by an employer. Uh, never put yourself in between risk and harm and your equipment because your equipment can be replaced. Keep yourself safe. And that's a, a hard reality for a lot of people because they take pride. That is their that's their way of making their their living. But realistically, you can continue on and buy new equipment. So. Don't buy from rest to protect your equipment. Steve? You know, just, yeah, just thinking about it, uh, you know, to a construction worker, uh, and again, talking about employees now, so OSHA is going to have a voice in this as well uh, in terms of protecting the workforce. But to construction workers, those are his or her tools of the trade. But the other term we use when we talk about construction tools, we call them burglar tools. Tools make excellent burglar tools. That pry bar that a construction worker is using also makes a great forcible entry tool for the bad guy. So make sure you protect your tools as well. Keep them secured when you're not using them. Keep them locked up. Keep them accounted for. Inventory them. Uh, because when they fall into the wrong hands, uh, they, they can be very damaging in a lot of different ways. Great, great points. That brings us to uh, the last of our questions. Um, and I titled it Wild Wild West. I all heard stories of shopkeepers, quote, unquote, keeping watch over their businesses. Do you have any hard numbers on effectiveness of the strategy? The anecdotal evidence, we've all seen the evidence on TV with, with the counter protesters and the groups that are trying to protect the neighborhood links and properties. Uh, it may seem successful. But you know, you have to know the rules of engagement for uh, 
lethal force. And we're a lot of times these guys are armed and they're protecting property. So you gotta know the rules of engagement in your state for the use of force for deadly force, lethal force application, and to protect property. And oftentimes, it's legal. So it's gonna get sued. And remember, we just bought at the beginning of this presentation the unfortunate incident where the retired officer was providing security services, armed security services at a location in St. Louis. And he was killed. He was overtaken by a mob of people, and he was killed, unfortunately. His family has to deal with that. So to put your life on the line to protect property from urbanization or damage, paint, whatever it might be, it's a risk. And your insurance providers are going to have an opinion on that also. So just be very careful about this. It's unfortunate, and I don't see any of these family businesses suffer from this either. But, uh, you know, keep and watch over your business, stand there for the whole time. It's going to be controversial, and that application of lethal force, you may feel is justified, but by the end of the law, by the law, uh, it may not be justified in your state. So just be very, very careful with that. Excellent. Safety person, so I definitely want to avoid those types of risks as much as possible. I know it's not all avoidable. There are always very important questions about whether or not it's necessary. These are property issues. For the most part, we need to lose any lives over any of these issues. And like everybody, I'm sure my heart breaks uh, for the passions on, on the protester side and uh, the people related to the violence and the, the, the victimized businesses. It's very difficult. So again, thank you for your participation. Um, just including, um, want them to everybody. They do offer security support services through our partners in loss control, including Morrison and Wilder and Associates, and our friends Fire and Life Safety, who also help us with incident incident command. Uh, I appreciate them stepping up in such a short amount of time. We actually put all, all of this together in less than 24 hours. So thank you for all the work behind the scenes of putting all of this together. Uh, thank you for allowing me to record this so I can share this with everybody who attended. And uh, um, I'm going to wrap up here and one more time thank our friends at Sorensen and Wilder and uh, for everybody at Gallagher Bassett, I'm Vernon Iturralde and we're very happy that you could participate in our conference on uh, civil disturbance. Thank you very much and uh, have a great day.